All right, well, I'll do a quick intro and then hand it over to, to Mark to present most of uh, this uh, webinar today. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Tad Bradley from the Cassini Collection. I'm based out in Seattle. Uh, Mark is uh, back in Toronto, so we've got both coasts well covered. And we're joined by our partner, Amit Sankala from Encounters Asia, who is actually briefly uh, in his home, his, his North American home of Vancouver, British Columbia, just up the road from me here in Seattle. Uh, typically, he's in India this time of year, but he's come back, I think, for kids' spring break to do some snowboarding. So a little bit of a, a, little bit of a break from, from India for a week. Uh, we appreciate you guys joining us today as the introduction or as the invite um, illustrated. What we're trying to do today is to show you uh, a little bit about how Indian safaris uh, differ and are unique um, from African safaris. Obviously, for those of you that know Kusini well, our roots are in Africa. Um, we've been representing various properties and tour operators throughout Africa for going on 13 years now. And, um, and India was a brand new experience for both Mark and I as of, as of January. So we came into it completely complete newbies to Indian um, experiences, safaris, culture, and both of us came away just absolutely wowed and blown away by the experience. But it is quite different from African safaris, and so that's what we want to, to, to lay out, especially for you Africa sellers, um, how India and safari experience does differ from Africa. Uh, not better, not worse, just different, and I think that's what we'll emphasize today. We'll also dig into a little bit of the cultural experiences that we were able to pair with um, with our, our wildlife experiences on our fam trip. So, um, and Encounters Asia is, uh, I've known Amit for going on, I don't know, Amit, almost 15 years back to my days previously at Wildland Adventures. And um, we eventually got paired up during the pandemic. Um, Amit's company, Encounters Asia, is a perfect fit for Cusini, owner-operated, smaller boutique company, trade-focused, and has an amazing um, foundation in, in history and conservation and, and community engagement in India, which you'll see throughout the presentation. So I've uh, been thrilled to have Ahmed on board for well over a year now and to finally get over to India to explore his world was, uh, as I said, just absolutely um, fantastic and, and mind blowing and, and uh, exceeded my expectations for India in, in so many different ways. In addition to being a boutique tour operator in India, they also operate in Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. And they, uh, Amit and his family own and operate three different tiger safari camps in Bandavgar, uh, Kana, and in Pench. And we'll touch on those as well. But they are a full service DMC and work with all of the other um, uh, safari camps that live up to their standards uh, throughout the, the country. So Mark, I'll hand it over to you to kind of kick off our story of the of the fam, and <laughs> Amit and I will jump in for color commentary here and there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to just take a little bit of a trip down in uh, down memory lane, and I do a quick recap, really quick recap of the fam that we did in 2023. You know, we had an amazing time um, exploring most of northern and central India. So we started off in uh, uh, in Delhi. And then headed off to Jaipur. Actually, I wasn't here yet. Tad um, started here uh, with with the rest of the group. And then after Jaipur, I met up with them in Varanasi, and then continued on to do three tiger parks, which we'll talk about a lot during this uh, webinar. So we did Bandavgar, Kana, and Pench, all in a central part of of India. Uh, and then the rest of the folks went home, as well as Tad, and I continued on exploring Rajasthan, visiting. Uh, Jodhpur and Udaipur. Uh, just real quickly, and for those that are here on the fam, you'll see a lot of your photos uh, on this presentation. Uh, Delhi was was great for everybody. It's a shock for the senses, but for all the good reasons. Uh, and you know, the group was pretty brave trying on street food, uh, but you know what? No tummy aches, eh? Everyone, uh, I made it through okay. So that was a really cool. Interesting experience. Uh, that, that guy in the middle is uh, is Rohit. He um, welcomed me um, when I landed in in Delhi. So the hospitality you'll see right away is absolutely amazing when you when you come to India. And Tad, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about that train ride uh, heading into to Jaipur. You can see on the top right photo. <laughs> Yeah, just just quickly on on Delhi too. You know, the old town um, lived up to all of its uh, its reputation as a true feast for all of the senses. 
in all the good, bad, and, and crazy ways. Um, I absolutely loved it, uh, but it is an intense experience. Um, and uh, and I think something that um, it's good for your clients who are really looking for that, um, you know, that immersive city experience in India to uh, to do it. great guides as well. Uh, Ahmed has some great local guides in, in Delhi that that really kind of get you under the skin of the of the city in a safe way. As Mark said, we tried street food and we all uh, all survived it, despite, of course, you know, warnings to the contrary everywhere else uh, people tell you. So Delhi is um, is is a massive city, um, but I think a really great uh, first stop, um, one that does kind of give you that that shock to the senses in in, in mostly good ways. Uh, and some amazing properties as well, which we won't go into all of them, but there's there's a variety of uh, of different great hotels in the city. And then we um, we decided to take the train to Jaipur because um, we wanted to have that experience of of taking an Indian train. It's not something that um, most of our Encounters Asia guests would do today, for the most part, and sometimes to Ag to Agra uh, from Delhi because it's a, a short ride. But today there are so many regional flights that it's less um, necessary to take those long train rides, but it's about a four hour trip from Delhi to, ja to, uh, to Jaipur. I'm a train nerd, so I was really excited to get on that train and it lived again, lived up to expectations. We did stay in the first class um, car and, and really had, you know, felt like we were traveling like, you know, like uh, Indians do, like upper class Indians would. And, and um, it really gave us that sense of how uh, rural it is between uh, the cities, but still, you know, lots of incredible culture out the window, kind of absorbing culture by osmosis as, as the train went along. And then we arrived in, uh, in Jaipur and um, spent the next couple of days uh, immersing ourselves in, in this incredible city, um, you know, part of the, the Golden Triangle. Um, you can see some of our, our shots there from the city palace. We were able to have a, a private tour of the private residence, not open to the public. Um, Amit's team is able to get us in there to experience some of the uh, the off limits parts of the the city palace which is the the the, the residence of the the Jaipur royalty um and uh and then had an incredible I don't think it's fair to call it a cooking class um because Durga Singh is his experience is much more than just learning how to cook um a few you know Indian dishes it's really a cultural afternoon and there's a variety of ways that um that he can set up an afternoon based on your client's interests from flying kites to learning how to, to wrap um, one of the turbans, which we all did. We didn't have a picture of the guys, but all the guys had turbans on and, and the women had their saris. Um, and it really gives you a, a feeling of, um, of, of calm in a, in a very busy city as well. And in his beautiful Haveli, it's a, he's a, his family is a lesser royal family, um, and, but they have a beautiful Haveli right in the center of, of Jaipur. Um, and then also, again, a feeling of really being immersed in this culture. Um, through your through food, through dress, uh, through traditions like flying kites, if people are interested in doing that. Um, and he also does walking tours of the local markets. Um, and he is truly an incredible character. Um, so very, very well worth an afternoon in Jaipur to, to really get under the skin again of this of this very busy uh, and very beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, we stayed at this uh, Samod Haveli, which is an amazing uh, again, royal residence. You'll hear that a lot in, in India. A lot of the former royal palaces, of course, are now um, boutique hotels. And the Samod Haveli was was a was a wonderful property. We met the owner of the property there. He gave us a nice talk on the history and and uh, shared a sundowner drink uh, with us as well. And from there, yeah, Mark, we carried on to Varanasi, which um, Ahmed has talked to me about Varanasi for many years, um, and so I had it built up in my mind: uh, the good, the bad crazy again and again it lived it lived up to and exceeded those sort of expectations uh i think ahmed has said to me it's not for everybody um, right off the bat and i think that's true but um for people that really are looking for something uh that does challenge you that does blow your mind that is incredibly spiritual in you know coming from a catholic christian perspective very different um yet very similar in other ways too uh varanasi was uh well, lived up to all of that and exceeded, like I said, my my preconceived notions and, and expectations. And I think what's great about Varanasi, Tad, is when we're there, you're really immersed in the culture and the spirituality of of the place. Like you know, we were going in in some of these temples, and you're right next to people that are playing, uh, praying, and they don't 
really care or mind that you're there observing, you know, there that it's happening right then, then and there in front of your face. It's a living historical city. And, you know, if you ask a lot of people that went in the fam with us, this was one of their, their favorite places just because it, it hit a little bit differently. It's just, it's in your face. Um, culturally, it, it's, it's amazing. Spiritually, you're, you're there right next to the, the cremation ground. So yeah, it, it's just an absolutely amazing city, in my opinion. And Jeremy is our, our guide there in lower right, who, as you can see, is not from there. He's actually a six foot three uh, white guy from Minnesota, but he's been living in uh, Varanasi for going on 20 years. And he seemed to know everybody in that town. Uh, he was really well loved and respected by the, the two gentlemen in the lower left are uh, musicians. We had a private um, uh, jam session with these two guys. Uh, and Ahmed can probably tell you more about them, um, but but uh, they've been best, you know, good buddies with Jeremy for many years. Um, he knows all uh, many of the priests who are um, who are involved in the RT ceremonies, which is the the Hindu um, services that we attended both in the evenings, which happened every single evening, and in the morning as well. At center photo, at vertical photo, is a photo of the RT in the morning at six a.m. on the banks of the Ganges in the mist and the fog. I mean, it's I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting goosebumps again. But being there in that moment was just. Um, you know, an incredibly spiritual experience. Again, coming from a, you know, a Catholic schoolboy like myself, it, it's just, it, you really feel it um, when you're there. And especially when you're there with a guy like Jeremy, who can, again, give you that, get you into that culture, that, that spiritual tradition, but also coming at it from a perspective of a Westerner. Um, and so he can kind of speak your language and kind of translate it for you in, in many ways. Um, and then Mark, maybe a little bit about that dance performance that we had in the upper right. And Barry yeah, sure. And, and then we had a, uh, a private <clears throat> dance uh, performance right in front of us. And I think Varanasi is known for um, it, also its music and culture. So you do have a lot of your uh, musicians that practice uh, classical um, in Indian music and the performance is right there in front of us. And what's great about these performances is that there's just super thankful uh, being able to, to show their craft in front of us. Um, so, so for, you know, for a lot of us, it's also another highlight uh, seeing the, the sights and sounds of, of Varanasi. I think the last thing I'll say before we jump to the Tigers yeah. is Varanasi, Delhi, Jaipur. I mean, there are one point, two billion people in India, and you do feel that in Varanasi, in, certainly in Delhi, in Jaipur. Uh, walking through the really crowded old town streets of Varanasi, um, again, just absorbing the culture and the experience, I felt as did our entire group felt completely safe. We had one, a couple guys who got lost um, on their way walking from our lunch stop back to our hotel, and, and actually Ahmed encouraged us to go get lost because- Make friends. Get lost because somebody will, will take you where you need to go. And that's exactly what happened with the group that got lost. They, you know, they, they found some locals who clearly could tell they didn't know where they're going and they, they took them right to the, the doorstep of the hotel. So again, oh, yeah. notions and reputation, uh, all of that, um, we, we never felt unsafe at all, even in those very, very crowded spaces in the very crowded, um, beautiful, active old towns like in Varanasi. Awesome. And then on to Bandergard, which, which is the highlight for a lot of us, for sure, having some really amazing tiger sightings, which we'll go into to detail in a sec. But it's just such a gorgeous park, um, kind of reminded us of, uh, of, of Jurassic Park coming in. Um, and you'll see the, the Scarpman in the background. You know, it's just a, a very cool and scenic place to, to see tigers. and it was an eye opener for us because in the first day we actually didn't get to see any tigers and we had to work a little bit harder for them uh, to see it. But when we did, the sightings in Vandergar were absolutely exceptional. Um, and it's just such a cool area where you see in the top right there, this is, there's a, uh, I think that's Shiva, right? If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> my notes are correct. There's a massive statue. Vishnu, of, Vishnu. Oh, oh, Vishnu, sorry. Of Vishnu just right dead smack in the middle of the park. So you just can't imagine how how gorgeous this park 
is you, with, with tigers uh, in your foreground and you also have that big statue of Vishnu on the top of the hill. Cool. And then moving on after uh, Bandavgar, we went over to, uh, to Kana, um, which also had, we had some amazing tiger sightings as well, but also other animals such as wild dogs. Uh, I really love the Barashinga. It's a swamp deer with these massive, massive antlers that, that, that go down in the water and they, they come up and you get this amazing photo that you see there in the middle uh, with the reeds and, and water coming down. So if you're a photographer, this is one of those places that are just, you know, a great place to take photographs in really good settings. And listening to the Barasingas, it was rutting season as well. So again, a moment that gave me goosebumps was sitting in our vehicle. Sun had just risen. We're at a you know a water a water pond, and the Barasinga is there doing his uh, his mating call or his rutting call. And it's just a uh, very melancholy. Very you know I'm mean, sure people have heard that call from from uh, other antelopes and, and other uh, ungulates and it, it it does really kind of go to the, the core of your being and it was again one of those very memorable mo moments on on this trip and certainly on safari yeah. and then you can see at the bottom uh center there is uh is dimple who's the the manager at uh kana jungle lodge and you know she gave us a really um impactful stay while we're staying at the the jungle lodge because not only was she doing cooking demonstrations and not only was she doing uh you know masala teaching us how to make masala chai she was also she's also a naturalist and she showed us all the different uh insects and and, and the flora and fauna that just surround the park so for us that, that's what makes you know kind of special for for anyone traveling here Okay, and moving on, maybe Tal, you want to talk a little bit about Jamtara? We had some, and, and Penge. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if I had to pick a favorite camp, uh, pet, you know, Jamtara camp would would be it. it. It's probably of the places we stayed the most similar to a, to an African safari camp, um, and uh, and it's really integrated into the community, which I think sets it apart. Uh, Penge is a, and again. Each of these parks similar in a lot of ways, but very different in so many others. Uh, and Pench uh, was a um, a teak forest versus a saw forest. If I'm if my naturalism naturalist credentials <laughs> are maybe revoked by Ahmed here, but I think that's correct. Um, <laughs> so it had a little bit of a different feel to it. Um, wild dogs again there, um, just you know incredible bird species throughout. For we had a couple of, of birders on our. On our fam, and um, and they were uh, they were in heaven and, and on their eBird apps as well. So Gina's, I think, with us. Um, she, she knows what I'm talking about. Um, no incredible amount of birding and, and pench in particular. Uh, and where Jamtara is set in the uh, in the buffer zone within the community, and happens to be set right around this beautiful banyan tree, which you can see in the upper right there. So a perfect place for uh, you know for an evening drink before before dinner, kind of around a boma, if you will, again, using African parlance. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the community experiences there. But that that really stood out for me was that combination of um, incredible wildlife uh, viewing during, you know, the mornings and and the afternoons going to visit the local village and, and actually getting to meet local people um, and being welcomed by them. It happened to be a holiday while we were there and uh, we were asked for a lot of selfies. Again, we'll get to that, but. <laughs> And then after that, I, you know, we said goodbye to the rest of the group, but I continued on to, to Jodhpur, going to the north in, in Rajasthan, and an absolutely gorgeous city. Uh, it's a little bit more laid back than, than Jaipur. Uh, you can see there it's referred to as the blue cities because you see some of the old homes painted in blue. But one of my favorite things in, in Jodhpur is having lunch with, with Ahmed's uncle. You know, they welcome me home. Hey, come on over. We took a uh, we walked from the fort to um, its uh, old house where he grew up and just had a nice, amazing meal with his uncle. And, you know, these, one of these travel moments are you can't you can't find them anywhere. Right. These these are special and, and it really immerses you in, in the Indian culture, being welcomed by by someone that, you know, that, that lives there. 
uh, and and we went to the fort. Of course, the fort is the highlight. It's probably one of the nicest uh, museums you've seen in, in 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 India. Everything is so well preserved. It's so well organized. And there's some some things that we can do here for for your clients. You know, when the when the fort closes to the public. Amit's team can actually uh, give you access to some parts of the fort. They can open it up for you uh, for with for um, uh, for the evening with a little bit of supplement, and and you can do all sorts of things in uh, in in the fort. Like I think Amit, you said you can have dinner at the fort and go to some of the rooms that are not open to the public. Yeah, it gives that sort of exclusivity feeling by being able to go to a fort, which is a couple of hundred years old and have that sort of private experience. You know, that's what you're, you know, as an agent, that's what you're upselling. You know, you can sell the standard joke for trip and, and then do the walks and do the lunch and all that bit. But then, you know, if the client has the budget, because, you know, ideally India is a cheaper destination than Africa when you're quoting files, these are the enhancements that you can do, which make you sort of different and unique and, you know, that others aren't offering and you're not even reading about them online at all. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. And then after that, ended off the trip uh, in the Lake District in in Udaipur. Uh, if any one of you guys have seen uh, James Bond Octopussy, this is where uh, one of the hotels is where they filmed it. Uh, it's just a nice, more laid back uh, part of of Rajasthan, and you know, the air is actually a little bit. Uh, cleaner and nicer over in Udaipur. You can see how how fresh it is. Uh, the photo on the top right, we went to a local temple uh, and just the energy and the vibe of this place is is something else. So it's a really good way to relax and end your trip if you're you're doing a full circuit. Because by this point, I was I was a little bit <laughs> I was a little bit tired. So it's a good place to unwind and having that water in front of you is is quite serene. Um, so that's it. That's our our fam itinerary. As you can see, we have uh, the jungle and tigers in the middle of the itinerary, and we book ended it with some cultural experiences. So these are some of the the things that Amit's team can can do for you guys. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about itineraries and how you can build them and what makes the most sense and how you can enhance them. All right. But for now why we came to this webinar. We'll talk a lot about tigers. <laughs> That's a shot that I took in, uh, in, in Kana. So you, what you'll see, uh, a lot of the photos on, on this webinar, we tried to just add the ones that we took on the fam trip so that you can see it. Uh, you know, it, It's live, it's not a marketing photo. These are the photos from the fam participants. So sometimes you'll hear us give shout outs to some of the participants on this, uh, on this PowerPoint. Uh, just to give you the lay of the land, uh, this is a map of northern and central India. Up here is what a lot of people would call the cultural golden triangle. So Delhi, Agra, and Jaipur. It's probably the most marketed uh, itinerary that you can that you can find. A lot of people sell it. It's an easy sell. It's relatively close to each other. Um, you'll see other points of interest in Rajasthan, like Jodhpur and and uh, in Udaipur, but up he uh, down here at the bottom in Madhya Pradesh are the parks where we spent a lot of time uh, in, in Bandavgar, uh, Kana, and Pench. So we're gonna focus our tiger conversation right in this area, uh, but India does have a lot more other parks than these three parks, but these are just the ones that we happen to focus on. Um, you can see that right here. So this is uh, just a, a map of, of Madhya Pradesh and I just, uh, put in the red box where um, the parks that we visited. Cool. And of course, our, uh, uh, our story isn't complete if you didn't talk about the three generations of, of tiger conservation in India, starting with um, the gentleman in the top, top left, which is actually Amit's grandfather, uh, Kailash Sankala, who was basically the, the person that led into India's pro Project Tiger. Essentially, you know, his grandfather is the one that uh, set aside pieces of land to conserve tiger that allowed us to do what we're doing today. And Amit, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about this as well. Yeah, no, thank you, Mark. Uh, my grandfather actually started something called Project Tiger, which is 50 years of uh, Project Tiger is happening uh, in the first week of April this year. And the idea of Project Tiger was to, you know, set aside land throughout the country for tiger and its habitat and remove human-animal conflict back in 1971. 
and it was spearheaded by the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi at that time, and he was the first director of Project Tiger, so he created the first nine tiger reserves of the country. Um, and uh, by 73, it became illegal to kill tigers in the wild, and today we've gone from nine tiger reserves to about 50 tiger reserves in the country, so it's been quite a successful program, and, and what we have conserved tigers and, and, and all that means we have 50 national parks in the country which have tigers in them wild tigers in them and our national parks are when we compare africa and india you know are quite big like kana he's talking about mark just talked about is about 2200 square kilometers bandhagar is about 1100 square kilometers so they are massive tracts of land but the biggest problem that was happening was you know the villages and the people were also growing so to be able to relocate villages back in the 70s 80s and 90s and even today um, you know into areas which are more inhabited by people and removing that human animal conflict was the essential thing and that's what makes the national parks of today uh so i was quite fortunate that my grandfather started that whole movement uh, through through the years and, and today we have 50 tiger reserves awesome and when you get a chance please uh, you know, make sure you watch the documentary called tigerland uh You'll see Amit there. You'll hear the story about uh, tiger conservation in India. Uh, you'll see some familiar uh, faces that we talked about, like uh, like Dimple and um, and and their son Jay, who who's a big uh, star in that that documentary. So when you, when you get a chance, please, I highly recommend watching Tigerland. And and all that conser conservation work allowed allowed us to have this. So this is what you'll typically see when you spend, you know, we spent six days on safari on, on this trip and we saw a good amount of predators from uh, different tiger sightings uh, to even leopard. Uh, I think this is a sighting from, uh, from Chris's uh, phone, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's why it's a little bit blurry that, that sighting of the leopard in the, the bottom, uh, bottom center. Uh, we also saw um, Asiatic wild dogs. Actually, we had a couple of sightings, which was amazing. We tracked them for, for quite some time. Uh, and then we also saw some jackals. So the predator sightings were absolutely amazing. And these are all photos from uh, fan participants, you know, thanks to, to Chris, Bert, uh, Katie, and, and Tad taking some of the, these photos. Uh, and to give you a bit of a context, you know, I think my vehicle saw six tigers in total. Uh, and two of them were very, very good premium quality sighting. Like where we were able to get these amazing photographs, but the other four were average to, to not so good. You know, the, the other sighting that we had, <laughs> right. It was outside the gate and it was, I think it was in Bandavgar or Kana and you couldn't really see the tiger, but all the guys kind of just say, Hey, there's a tiger right by the gate. And the next thing you know, they, they hide by the bush, right? So some of the sightings that we had were quite fast. You couldn't get your camera ready right away, but in some of them, we were able to get some uh, really amazing shots and really get to spend some time with them. Um, <clears throat> here's just a little video of uh, that, that male tiger where we were able to get that shot, uh, shot up front. They just walk right by us. You can see how, how gorgeous and beautiful it is. And... You know, it's it's a cat. It's a big cat, and this is actually a pretty funny video because you'll see shortly it gets scared of its own tail, <laughs> and it jumps. Demystifies this really burly tiger, <laughs> right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this is a video taken by by Katie uh, from the fam, and you can get up close to to that tiger, and we probably spent a good five minutes with that tiger before it it went away. Uh, so it, it can be that quick, but the quality of those sightings are, are absolutely amazing. Um, and apart from, from tigers, you also see a, a really good diversity of other mammals in, in the different parks that we visited from, you know, from the spotted deer to the barashinga that, that we talked about, uh, gaur, uh, sambar deer, uh, I can't remember what the one in the middle is called, Ahmed. You got to help me out here. <laughs> oh, we, uh, the gore and the one below Nilgai is the blue bull. Yeah, blue bull, blue bull, exactly. So there are different uh, species all over and absolutely gorgeous um, uh, mammals that you can photograph, uh, as well as the little ones. So you get a lot of uh, langur monkeys jumping around. They're, they're quite cute, uh, very similar to the vervet monkeys that you would find in Africa. Uh, you also see some of the wild boar around and, and mongoose, so they're quite uh, common. 
And for birders, we were able to get some amazing bird shots. The, the, the bird in the top left, no, it's not a lilac breasted roller. This is the Indian roller not to be confused with the lilac breasted, but you know, we, we actually saw also a ton of uh, jungle owlet, these little, little owls that you see just about uh, everywhere, just amazing sightings, great colors on the, on the kingfisher as well as on the woodpeckers and some really good um, raptor and pre uh, uh, predator sightings as well for the birds. Yeah, for birders, I highly recommend, I, ch I checked off quite a, quite a lot on my list here. I want to talk a little bit about the sceneries, especially if you have clients that are really into photography. Uh, because of the lay of the land, you have the teak and the salt forest. What this creates for anyone that's really into photography is a really good depth of field. You know, when we talk about the Mara and the Serengeti, it's all about the open space. On your photograph, you get that nice negative space in in um in India, especially the parks that we visited, you you can put your subject in some really interesting uh, backgrounds. And what's really cool about these places, there's a lot of the roads create a lot of these really cool leading lines where you could put that tiger in the middle of it and create for just a really good photograph. The one on the left is actually a shot, shot taken by Tad uh, with the sun just coming out, you see the rays of the sun in front of the vehicle. This is taken, I think, Tad, you took this from your, your phone, right? It's yeah, yeah, absolutely gorgeous uh, shot. You know, you don't have to be that skilled, sorry, Tad, to be a photographer to get no. these kinds of shots. No offense taken, I'm very unskilled, <laughs> and uh, the phone helps, but it, you know, the subject and that the sunlight coming through those trees, I mean, could have taken a million of those shots. It was incredible, yeah. and, and you can put them, you know, there's a lot of these really interesting, uh, places like like old banyan trees with with things hanging around just absolutely amazing um and other kind of cool thing that you can find in india especially if you want to market the place you know you'll see them referred to as the big seven of india so you can see obviously the 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 bengal tiger we saw some leopards uh fortunately we didn't see um uh, the sloth bear, it's uh, it's Baloo. If you read um, the Jungle Book, they've also got the uh, the rhinos, Asiatic lions. Of course, we saw some of the wild dogs and um, and the Asiatic elephants. So you know there are these other species that that we didn't get to see because some of them you have to go to to different national parks to see them but just goes to show the the diversity that india has to offer and what we did those six days in three parks you know barely scratched the surface right so there's a lot more to discover uh when you go to india okay now moving on we want to do a little bit of a deep dive on uh, what what's different in india compared to your, your typical safari in Africa, you know, as Tad mentioned earlier, the wildlife sightings are amazing. And it's not any better or worse, I would say, than your safaris in, in Africa. I think the main difference is how you do it. You know, the how is, is what's different. And when selling India, I think it's really important to keep an open mind, especially for African safari sellers, because some of the safari styles and conservation models might work in Africa, it might not necessarily work in a place like India. Uh, because for instance, you know, if you take a look at the, the Maasai Mara, right? If you look at the number of visitors that are in the park at any given day, majority of those visitors are international travelers. Uh, but in India, we saw, we heard in a really amazing uh, stat that I think, what was that? Um, I think 70 or 80% of the people in the tiger parks in India are actually domestic visitors, right? So. Tigers yeah. for, for Indian uh, locals, right? So that's really one of the main differences. And, you know, that's that's also one of the main success stories of why it is it is like that. So the thing is, we come from a country with a, with a very strong sort of middle class, uh, you know, which, which travels. They love to travel. Uh, and especially during the pandemic, you know, you would think that, you know, national parks and especially in Africa were struggling, you know, no revenue coming in, all those problems. In India, it was the opposite. It was like Indians could not travel abroad. So they visited the national parks in big numbers. So what happens in the U.S., you know, where every U.S. national park or, or remote property was full because of U.S. travelers. So India has that. And the thing is, 
you know, there is a mindset of saying, you know, Indian travelers could be, you know, uh, annoying, but actually, I mean, Mark and Tad can share that the general sighting that when we pass the Jeep or something like that, I mean, Alexa's here laughing, so maybe I'll let her comment as well at this point, but Alexa's was probably louder than the Indian clients as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no, it's 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 actually a quite a good experience. I've I've been to Africa ten times, so I can compare of what what the experience and what the, the Indian in Africa is a little bit different. I don't mean to be racist here, but you know, I, uh, towards my own kind, I know how the new travelers are evolving, and I think they're more educated and and they take more sort of uh, you know appreciating everything. Let's put it that way. Exactly. So yeah, just some uh, some key differences, and we'll talk about this in in, in great detail. So. Highly, highly controlled and regulated. The safaris in India are quite controlled by the national parks. Um, there's a limited number of vehicles and permits allowed in the park. So when you're selling, and this is important when you're working with Amit, to make sure you get those permits, uh, you know, whenever possible. Because kind of think of it as... Uh, similar to gorilla tracking permits, where they, they become limited, especially in the high season. Um, as we mentioned, there's a different conservation mo model. There's not really any private game reserve or conservancies. There's there's one that we'll talk about later, but it, that thing doesn't really, you don't see that too often in, in India. Um, we want to talk a little bit about tiger tracking and game viewing, right? You know, when you're in the Mara or your Sabi Sands, you drive around, you're going to see your lions, your your leopards, your, your, your big game in three hours, you know, in, in in India, what I really loved about it is you brought back that whole idea of tracking, you know, listening to the sounds of the jungle, paying attention. In some cases, we were quiet for like a good half an hour listening to the alarm calls, right? That, that gives you a little bit of an excitement when, when you're doing your safaris in India. And we'll also talk a little bit about how the game drives work and the permits and you know, because you have to come in and out in, in specific times of, of the day, right? So I just want to go into this next slide just to give you an idea of some of the regulations in, in the parks. Um, this is a map of Bandavgar, and you can see they have divided it into three different zones. So basically, the, the way it works, you know, the parks will issue a set amount of permits that are allowed to visit in each zone for game drive. Right, so that's what we mean when it's highly re regulated. So Ahmed, you want to add something to that as well? Yeah, only 20% of the national parks in India is actually open for tourism. And the highest density of tigers anywhere in the world, actually, in these are uh, in these particular parks that you're going to, sort of Bangabar, Kana, uh, these particular areas. And this Magdi, Tala, Ketoli, these are zones that have been opened over time as the parks have expanded. So, you know, every year, let's say a mother has cubs in different parks, different mothers have cubs, you know, more sightings happen, uh, a male tiger dominates in a particular area. So that knowledge is actually very important. If you if you book a general trip, let's just say for with, with a culture operator, you know, who you, is used to doing the cultural itinerary and such things, that knowledge isn't there with them. You know, the knowledge, because we have a base in all these parks, they, it depends on whichever camp you book in. And I'm not saying that one has to book into our camps. We are a full service company. So we'll book into, you know, the X and, X and beyond camp or, or Samo Safari Lodge or any sort of, depending on the caliber of the client, where do you spend your money on, which zone you should go to, all that sort of does matter. And then you can enhance enhance these experience to making it closer to an Africa experience by selling something called a full day exclusive permit, which Mark will talk about in a second. So these, these, these zones that you are given, like Tala, Magdi, Ketoli in this particular case, you know, you're restricted to that particular zone for the morning or the afternoon. So you go in the park at six o'clock in the morning and come out around 1030. Then you go again to 33 o'clock in the afternoon, come back around sunset. And you're given a particular zone, so that way the vehicles are distributed, and we don't have overcrowding vehicles over one particular tiger. You know, some zones have only 18 vehicles, some only have 15, some have 23. So it depends on the size of the zone, and that way the vehicles get distributed in that part of the park. And we can try different zones as well, just to give you guys a good diversity of the park. But what a full day permit does is gives you eternal access into the park all given times. You can go anywhere, any zone, you can enter before everybody, you can stay in the park in the afternoon. So the park is yours, uh, which makes a huge difference that if you're having an amazing tiger sighting at 930 in the morning, and everybody now has to sort of leave because the park closes around 10, 30, 11, you know, uh, when they leave at 10 o'clock, you're still with your tiger or her cubs or whatever, they've come to drink water in the afternoon, you know, 
know, you have your exclusive tiger sightings. So there are ways of enhancing the experience to take it, you know, close to sort of exclusivity uh, when you're trying to sell safaris in India. Yeah, and what's good with working uh, with Ahmed's team, and I was fortunate enough to spend some time in, in their office, is that, you know, they'll they'll give you recommendations on what works best. So if you tell um, Ahmed's team that, hey, look, I got a photographer and these are my days, this is how logistics work, you know, we'll book the full day permits for where it makes sense, right, you know maybe you come in uh in the in the afternoon and you you do just do an afternoon game drive so you just book the half day permit and in the next two three days we could book you all all full day permits or just in some of those days right so you have you can you have that that flexibility working with Ahmed's team to make sure uh we put your your clients in the right zones in the right times and and giving them the right permits um Cool. So yeah, that just gives you hopefully a, a good lay of the land. The same thing applies when you're in in Kana, and obviously likewise the same thing when you when you go to to Pench. So it's a very very similar style where they they separate into different zones, and you're only allowed to enter on those zones. And the one thing I wanted to add as well, some parks are more strict than others. Like for instance, in Bandavgar, we had to show our passports uh, to make sure that we're <laughs> on the vehicle that was designated to us, right? In Africa, you can kind of just go <laughs> uh, whenever you want, right? In in India, that's, that's very regulated and very um, very controlled. So that's that's a good thing, I think, uh, uh, for for those that operate safaris. Okay, cool. Then moving on to the type of vehicles uh, that we use. So a lot of you guys might ask, hey, you know, what's with the small <laughs> mini <laughs> four by fours? But you know what? You actually need to be in this vehicle, especially in this kind of terrain. So if you look back at the video that, that we just saw, that tiger was there on the road for like two, three minutes. And then, then it's gone. It's in the thicket. So you need to be able to maneuver and and pivot really fast. So these small uh, Suzuki Marudis can can do that for you. Um, so this is a video of uh, pictures of us, you know, waiting in to get in the park. So you can see we have to wait at those designated times uh, to get in and everyone gets in at the same time, except if you have a full day permit, which allows you to be in the park. Okay, um, and here you can actually see the way Ahmed has set up the vehicles. Um, you'll often hear him talk about having his own naturalist or a large naturalist, as well as the driver of the of the vehicle and as well as the gate guide. So Ahmed, you wanna talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so all the vehicles are not owned by us. Generally, there's an employment scheme by the government which allows us to take two of the vehicles that we own into the park and the rest we hire from the local roaster. Uh, it's actually quite a good good place because you know the drivers have also taken an incentive to learning more about the birds and you know showing and learned English and develop very well over time. So we have chosen the people that we want to take in the park. That way, those are the particular drivers. Now, when we talk about gate guide, it means that the guide has to be taken from the local village in the area. So it's also again an employment guarantee scheme. The idea is that the the, the involvement of the community is important when you're in India because the, the, we, we don't have fenced parks. You know, these are not private game reserves or anything. This is the jungle. Tigers come out into the village all the time. Elephants come out into the village. There are problems that happen. Hence the, the, the revenue needs to flow back into the communities that are near the national parks. Hence everything is done to enhance that employment within them. Uh, and that's why there is somebody who comes as a gate guide, as they call it. Some are very good and exceptional, uh, who, who, who know all their birds, speak amazing English, and some don't even speak a word. But it is essential to have that person in the vehicle because of that. Having said that, we make sure that every vehicle has a very good English speaking, you know, articulate guide who can talk about alarm called safaris. And of course, not just about one, the park you're in, but generally wildlife in India. So somebody, an excellent guide, an exceptional guide will either be your driver, your gate guide, or somebody from our camp who is going to be accompanying you. So that is our job to guarantee. These vehicles that you see, we never put more than you know two people in a row. That is four people per Jeep uh, as when it comes down to clients. That's sort of the limit that we 
play with uh, and uh, keeping everybody comfortable. And just because it is closer to the ground, unlike Africa vehicles and the amount of terrain that you're going to, the terrain is very different in India. It's not like the savannas of, of Africa where you can just turn a big Land Rover around anywhere. You know, you have to move quickly when sightings happen. These Jeeps are the most ideal thing in that kind of a terrain and quite comfortable. In. And many people on this fan trip, you know, who are here could probably also vouch for the difference. Yes, it's not, it's not, doesn't have the wide leg spaces of where you can uh, put a tripod on. Uh, but, you know, photographers work very differently and we customize things very separately for photographers where only two people in a Jeep sit when it's a photography group. So we can talk about that separately based on somebody's interest on is it photographers versus generalist clients. And there, there are a handful of Land Cruisers out there. And I have to say, um, I never realized how loud land, diesel Land Cruisers are uh, until I was in India in these Suzuki because they're they're petrol and they're super quiet uh, and you can't hear them until they're really, you know, right now next to you, whereas you can hear the Land Cruiser that felt like miles away. So I think we actually, in this case, in India, as Ahmed said, for a whole host of reasons, these, these Suzuki um, Jeeps are, are far preferable. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly the noise is, is a big factor, being much quieter. Cool. Um, another thing we wanted to talk about uh, briefly is how important the community involvement is in, in the national parks. And this is a really good example that you can see at Jantara where um, when we went there, it was village day or yeah, it was market day uh, in, in the local village. But you can actually see Ahmet staff <laughs> uh, from Jantara, you know, uh, picking up produce in, in the local market. So there's a lot, it's really, really good uh, synergy between the community and, and the safari operators within, within that area. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what they would call the, the Kana Pench Corridor and some of the conservation success that, that they've done here. Um, you know, I was just looking at some stats. Uh, when Project Tiger started, you know, the population the population was uh, of the tigers. The first census when it happened in 1972, there were only eight, 1,800 tigers left in the wild. Uh, prior to that, in 1947, there were about 40,000 tigers estimated. Now, when the Project Tiger started, the population went back up through 3,500 and went back down again because of, you know, habitat loss and some poaching. But now it sits at a healthy um, population of about, I think it was about 3,000 tigers in, um, in the wild in India. So you can see conservation happening right in front of your eyes. So I think that's super important to talk about. Uh, Amit, anything to add there? Yeah, you know, the thing is, we've we've been able to save tigers in pockets. And what we have saved in India is quite exceptional when it comes to tigers, leopards, wild dogs, bears, you know, snow leopards, Asiatic lions, wild elephants, wild buffaloes, sort of you name it, we have it. You know, the diversity of wildlife in India is quite incredible. It's just the safaris are not organized like they are in Africa. Hence, you never think of wildlife and you think India, you know, but actually Indian safaris are also uh, you know, throughout the country and for many different mammals, many different species when, when you're there. Um, India has grown to 1.3 billion people, right? We have been able to save all that with the, uh, with, with 1.3 billion people living in the country and our villages have expanded over time. So what has happened is that majority of our corridors are gone. There's not many corridors that are left, uh, but if we look at examples in, in many other places in the world, you know, corridors are being lost in the Amazon, being lost in the Pantanal, being lost in Madagascar, you know, either they're losing it to the paper industry, all that. With 50 tiger reserves that are in the country, which are national parks, no commercial activity can ever happen in them. So whether they could find diamonds in them or they could find a mine in them or anything like that, that doesn't happen. This was an exception, which is a Kana Pench corridor that was there, where this is the only sort of last strongholds of a corridor, which was quite successful. And there was a highway that needed to be built through it. And you see the, the picture on the left, there's like a eight lane highway that got built you know, through the corridor, not through the national park, but through the corridor. 
And this was a 10 year court battle to understand why this highway is important. And, and, and the judges ruled in saying that, listen, we will save tigers in pockets, but it cannot come at the cost of development. And that's when we, they create, started creating these green corridors, which you also see in Europe, maybe you see in America as well, where all these have underpasses where wildlife is passing, you know, and these have been cordoned off on the top. So the, uh, the noise also reduces when, when the wildlife is passing at night. There are tons of camera traps who have uh, in the last two, three years also captured, you know, mother and cubs crossing, wild dogs crossing, sloth bears crossing. So, you know, over time it may become successful. But having said that, we have still secured a fair percentage of land in the country for the tiger reserve. So the conservation battle in India, I think is very interesting. I almost think it's, it's even more successful than Africa in many, many ways, uh, just because of the amount of engagement of the local middle class, of the people of the community that are involved as a vested interest in saving our jungles. Awesome, thanks Amit. And kind of uh, our last point here in, in the difference, I wanna go back to the idea of um, of tiger tracking. Uh, you'll see a lot of photos. Uh, I mean, I know Tad loves selfies, but took a lot of selfies in the vehicle. <laughs> and that's actually because we were waiting. Uh, there are times where we were waiting for 35 minutes, 40 minutes, just listening to the sounds of the jungle, being patient, looking at, at pug marks of, of the tiger. So you're, you're having to really work for, for your sightings. And a lot of them were amazing. Right, but this is kind of the main difference. You kind of go back to that idea that you have to look for your wildlife. They're not just going to present themselves to you like, like, like they do in the Mara, you know, where you can have one game drive and you see lions, cheetahs, and leopards in two hours. <laughs> right, this you have to work a little bit. This photo is uh, illustrates that so well, Mark. And that's Indrajit, which is one of Amit's incredible naturalist guides, one of the best guides I've been with anywhere in the world, certainly one of the greatest naturalist guides I've ever had the pleasure of spending time with. And um, in that picture in the upper left or the, the left side, we were sitting probably for a half an hour, um, just taking in the sounds of the jungle and listening to a tiger call, which on its own was an exceptional experience. And we ultimately did find that tiger. Um, and so you feel like you really, Again, you worked for it, and it's a great feeling of accomplishment. Um, but it does kind of harken back to those to to real game tracking, um, and I think that is what makes India so so unique, so special. And it doesn't happen that often in in Africa. There are no radios in the vehicles. Guides are not radioing each other. They are having to to work for it. Yes, they do talk to each other when you pass in the park, but it's really about again eyes, ears, all the senses being heightened, um, trying to to find those elusive tigers. Uh, because again, this is a th thick, thickly forested national park, so it is a little bit harder to see game. Uh, but when you do find that tiger after a half an hour or more of working for it, wow, uh, what an experience! Again, getting goosebumps. Um, and uh, Mark, I think we're going to jump to some properties, and and then I think we can open it up to questions. If anybody does have questions, yeah. feel free to pop them in the chat, uh, and then we'll in about five minutes we can open it up to anybody that wants to to comment. Uh, as well. Yeah, so hopefully, guys, it gives you a good idea on how Tiger Safaris work, how it's different, how you can sell to your clients. Real quickly, we just want to show you the, the breadth of um, of different properties that Ahmed and his team can offer. Yes, they, they do own properties in Bandavgar, Kanch, and, and, and Kana, but they will book just about, um, you know, everyone that will that works well for your clients. So for instance, in Band of Guard, you have different options uh, from five-star like the Mahua Koti in, in Taj or a little bit more, um, actually, I kind of like the Samoan Safari Lodge to be honest, that, you know, that, that's got a really good vibe, very homey, um, uh, local, local, you can call it a chain, right? It's a local chain because they do have that property, uh, other properties around India, but it's not quite as, um, Corporate's probably not the right word, but it's not quite as corporate as the Taj uh, hotels. It's got just really homey feel to it. So you can see that there are different levels that you can you can offer. Um, but this is a good shot of Band of Gar Jungle Lodge. It's you know our, the first lodge that we stayed in. It's super comfortable right there in the jungle. Um, kind of you know in the evening you have your 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 fire in that boma setting. So it does give you that warm uh feeling and the hospitality especially at, at at this place is superb and top notch and it's one of the first lodges built um in band of Gar, if, if not the first lodge 
And I think Ahmed said a lot of the, the staff have been there for almost the entire uh, yeah. 20 plus years, 30 years. So that speaks to the hospitality, as Mark said. And then moving on to Kana, similar thing, uh, Banjar Tola, which is a Taj property. Um, actually, it was just so for some of you that might know the brand and beyond, this used to be an and beyond property until they pulled out. And now it's a Taj property, but you can kind of see a lot of and beyond elements when they came into uh, into India and start building these properties. So you do have that that five star uh, property there. We also like Singinawa. Uh, which is probably just slightly below that, but also very nice and and well decorated. Food is amazing. Um, but one of our favorites, uh, uh, Amit's Lodge, Kana Jungle Lodge. We love it here because you have uh, you're hosted by Dimple and and Tarun, and they can you know she's not just a naturalist. <laughs> She'll also show you how to cook and and make uh, masala chai so we really enjoyed that interactive experience with her and her family um, and then moving on to pench you also have you know once again the pench tree lodge you can stay at a property like that or another taj uh, or our favorite of course which is jamtara wilderness camp uh he's also got a sleep out there uh one of our fan participants actually a couple of them uh tried the sleep out and absolutely loved it the setting is just gorgeous uh under that uh the 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 campfire is right under that um banyan tree but it's probably the closest camp that we saw that reflects a lot of what you would have seen in, in Africa. So very similar in terms of style, but I would say the hospitality is just a little bit warmer here. Huh? Yeah, incredible decor as well. Ahmed can tell the story, uh, or we can send you a link to past webinars to tell the story of Jamtara, the the recycling of, of uh, different types of furniture from yep. the US Embassy, taking um, old uh, decks from 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 uh, scrapped boats to use as his flooring and uh, and then all of these little elements that he's picked up over the years having traveled to Africa 10 plus times as he said uh, you can see those woven into this this lodge and then the community-based aspect of it as you can see right here it's in that buffer zone um, it is uh, on community land and and you really do get a sense of being part of, of something bigger being part of a community when you're staying at Pench whether you go into the village or not I think you know, the village is something really special, though, to to have that experience to meet. Uh, we went to a, a house from um, one of the staff members from Jamtara. Um, they gave us a you know a tour of their homestead, um, gave us some uh, some tea. Uh, we got to taste some fruit from their garden, and then we went to the local market. We happened to be there on market day, um, and, uh, and and again, as Mark showed earlier, pictures of some of the Jamtara staff shopping for for um, you know vegetables and 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 food for. For our dinner that night so uh and it happened to be a holiday as well as you can see in that center that picture in the lower left speaking of selfies people loving selfies uh for whatever reason we uh we were kind of local celebrities and 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 were asked for a lot of selfies as we were walking back to camp which was which is kind of uh kind of a fun <laughs> experience and it happened to be my birthday too and that's a long story that i'll tell any of you that you <laughs> later, but uh, ahmed and his team pulled off and a really incredible birthday surprise for me that involved a tiger um, and champagne, and I'll leave it. <laughs> That's right. All right, cool. We're almost there. So, what what do you do next? Where do you put these parks in in your itinerary? Right. So, I'll, we'll show you uh, three different sample itineraries that that you can pitch to your your clients. Um, the most popular, probably, being our wildlife plus culture. So this is a really easy golden triangle of uh, Delhi, Agra, and Jaipur, combining those three uh, parks that we talked about. Uh, Ahmed, would you say this is your more or less the bread and butter? Yeah, I mean, if if people want to do an itinerary and they have the time, uh, you know, let's say 12 to 14 days, which is about two weeks minimum to do, then, you know, covering the Golden Triangle, because everybody wants to take off the Taj Mahal, they will land in Delhi and Jaipur, they want to do one cultural city, then sort of this works as the Golden Triangle, and then we can get them into one of the national park, at least do two, if not three of the national parks, that gives enough diversity of seeing tigers, wild dogs, you know, maybe sloth bears depends on the time of the year, uh, you know, to be able to see, get a more experience because there is another, and, and Mark, you want to jump to the next program as well, the one with Ranthambore? 
uh, let's jump to the next one, then we'll come back to this one. So this, there is another national park here called Ranthambore, which you have seen in all itineraries throughout, you know, whoever's marketing India. Ranthambore is definitely a very successful park as well. It's just a lot, and we sell quite a bit of Ranthambore, They're just because people don't have the time. So if you do Delhi, Jaipur, Agra, which is the golden triangle of India, and just want to throw in a tiger, the person does not really care about the experience of wildlife being like Africa, then Ranthambore works, because you hopefully will see tigers as great properties in in it. Uh, in Rantabo from Amman's to you name it, they have it, the Oberoi's uh, and, you know, but it's crowded. You know, you sometimes have 10, 20 seater canter trucks, which are inside the park as well. Of course, we will book you on a Jeep when you're there. But the point is, you know, it's a much more crowded experience because it's a victim of its own success. It sits in the Golden Triangle. It has amazing tiger sighting. It is a beautiful park, you know, so it, it takes all those boxes. But for a comprehensive sort of cultural tour of India, let's say Delhi, Jaipur, Agra, Jodhpur, Udaipur, all the ones that Mark talked about, and you want to just throw in a tiger, you know, it's just like, oh, I'm in India, I might as well see a tiger, then we can absolutely do Ranthambo for that. Uh, and if you go back, Mark, for a second, uh, Delhi, Bandagar Kana, Pensatpura. Now, this is a more central India focus, much uh, diversity of wildlife. And people say, do we, how different is one park from the other? That's also important to see because the landscapes in all these parks are very different from each other. So as, as they said, Penj is a teak forest, Kana is a sal forest, Bandagar is a mixed forest where you have the Vindhya Hills, the fort, you know, the, so the landscapes that get formed are very different from each other. Bandagar and Kana, very famous for its tigers, known around the world for their tigers, for sure. Uh, even Pench has great tiger sightings, but Pench is very famous for its leopards and wild dogs, uh, for example. And when we get into Satpura, you know, it, it, it has an overall, you know, focus on everything, tigers, leopards, wild dogs, and bears. But, uh, you know, one of the best places to see slots bears is Satpura, uh, excellent for leopards as well. And there are parts of Satpura which are also very good for tigers. So as a good diversity of doing many different things, that's a great comprehensive, uh, you know, program. Uh, to do that. Uh, and I'm just going to address the questions in, in the in the boxes of what time of the year is the best for sloth bears generally March, April, when it starts to get warm, you see more activity by them. And I would definitely focus on Pench or Sapura for them. And no, there's no off-roading allowed in India. Indian Tiger Reserves are very much, you drive on the routes that are sort of there by the park. Awesome. Thanks, Ahmed. <clears throat> Cool. So yeah, those are, you know, call it your, your meat and potatoes of your itinerary, those, those three that, that we've shown. And I think what Ahmed's team is really good at doing is making that itinerary good and turning it into an awesome itinerary uh, by adding these uh, in what we would call enhancements. There are places like, you know, I stayed at Bera Safari Lodge where leopards coexist with the shepherds. You literally have these Rabari shepherds in Rajasthan, uh, uh, with their um, with, with their goats, and in that same area, you will see leopards. So it's a very, very interesting style of conservation where, you know, the predator and and I guess it's prey sometimes live together. And surprisingly, the Bear Safari Lodge was, was got a lot of good press. Eh, Amit, I didn't really know about them until I went there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing is, America, generally, North America is not, you know, India is not very well explored in the North American market, to be honest. And the people that, they, you know, generally agents that are selling India, they are sticking to the normal route and not going beyond it, just because of knowledge. It's got no other reason that, you know, just they haven't been there or things like that. They are lovely properties, like he just talked about Bera Savai Lodge, huge conservation initiatives. And here we see Sujan Jawai, one of my favorite sort of camps. Again, this is a more private conservancy scenario, which the most amazing land landscapes in India with leopards and communities and that red color of the communities living amongst them. So photographically, it's amazing. And you can totally fit that in between two big cities of like Udaipur or Jodhpur, the blue city, and the city with the, the lake palace. You know, so there are many diverse, every destination in India is a new diverse, you know, experience. And that's what makes it so magical that it's not mundane. You know, you wake up to something amazing almost every day in every park. And this is a Relay Chateau property, property as well to add um, to that. And you, you can also, once again, going back to Rajasthan, you can spice up places like Mihargar, which is in the middle of the, of the Tar Desert. And, you know, it's actually 
it's not an old fort, it's a man-made castle, right? Like they built this from, from scratch to make it look like a sand castle. Uh, and it's a good place where you can break up, you know, seeing all the forts in uh, in, in the cultural cities and, and going out here in the desert to just relax and, and take in, um, you know, being in the middle of nowhere. And this is also one of the best places for Marwari horses where, you know, if, if you have clients who love riding, for example, it's an ex extraordinary place to go in the Rajasthan desert with the communities and go horse riding on the Marwari horses in India. Yeah, exactly. And other places like this, like uh, uh, Devshri, where, which I had lunch, you know, in between uh, if you're driving from Jodhpur to, um, to Udaipur, where I was hosted by, uh, by the family that's have had this, you know, this place for, what, since like 1400s or, or 15th century. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So you get these, Kind of the point is, there are a lot of these places that you're never going to find sometimes on the internet, or you never hear about them in publications. And these are the things that Ahmed's team can uh, suggest to you guys to enhance that experience so that you're not selling what everybody else is selling. Cool. And just to, to wrap up, you know, really why we've done all of this uh, uh, session on tiger safaris and some culture, but why would you book what encounters Asia? You know, it's really simply because they can put you guys in authentic heritage hotels. You know, it's good to obviously stay at some of those luxurious five-star brands like the Oberoids and the Taj, but it's also really neat to stay in some of these havelis where you can get proper cultural interactions, uh, and of course, they're wildlife experts. They know what they're talking about, being three generations in entire conservation. Ahmed's team knows exactly what they're talking about when it comes to, to wildlife in India. Uh, they give you that deep, meaningful connection with the local. We're not just passing by. This is immersive. This is authentic. And not to mention that they have amazing guides uh, not just from not just the naturalists, but the local guides in the cities as well. And to top it off, they are logistics expert. Um, they will get you from the different places that that you're selling your clients very seamlessly. You know, not it felt like I actually didn't even need to lift a finger on the spam on it. Their team took care of 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 everybody. But yeah, it, that's we had an amazing trip <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Cool, Tad, anything else to add? That's about it, no, eh? No, that, that's a great wrap up. I think really describes what makes uh, Encounters Asia so uh, fantastic as a local partner. Um, and I think, yeah, it was an absolutely eye-opening trip. I think the biggest thing, um, going back to just wrapping up the Tiger Safaris versus Africa, you know, is setting the right expectations. I think we said in our, in, in our um, email yesterday uh, that we sent out or a promotion of this webinar, you do have to kind of forget everything that you know about African safaris um, and focus on being on an Indian safari because it is different. And if you start comparing it to Africa, um, you, you're gonna find things that you don't like about uh, the Indian safaris or maybe some things that you like better, but let's be in India um, and, and, and be present and be focused on what makes in Indian safaris so unique and special. And I think Mark did a great job of illustrating that and the differences um, but setting those right expectations with your clients, especially those that have been to Africa, that this is different. This is India. But I mean, that video, I think, illustrated it so well, that tiger coming out of the out of the bush. Um, again, goosebumps, tear. And I know a lot of the guys in the car that were in tears. And that was their first tiger. Um, and it is something pretty special. Nothing against African lions. They're very cool. But I got to say, the tigers kind of blew the lions out, out of the water from my perspective. So. Uh, any other questions, you guys feel free to unmute if you want to you speak up. Um, we've got a couple more in the chat. And thanks for sticking with us. I know there was a lot of information to take in. Um, and hopefully it was all uh, useful and insightful. I thought, again, Mark, thanks so much for, for diving deep in here. I think it really was um, an incredible compare and contrast. Cool. How are we doing another fam next year, Lori? Absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly be putting one together. So stay tuned for that. Um, we can also obviously do independent fans too. Amit's um, team does that quite often. Um, if you're interested in going to certain times of year, you know, the season in India is a bit limiting in that it's, you know, basically late October, November through through April is the, the peak the time to do it. And the peak season is, you know, December through March. It's a little tough to do fans during that season typically. So ideally November or April is when we tend to uh, to try to put those those fans together.
Great question from Scott. Um, and I'll just jump in and then Ahmed to Mark any comments you have as far as opportunities to get out of the vehicle and walk around the landscape, nature walks, hikes. We, we did that at, at Kana, um, again with Dimple, a naturalist guide and host uh, of, at Kana Jungle Lodge in the buffer zone there, being able to go for a walk. Um, it's, you know, it's about the little things on those walks. It's about the insects, spiders. I mean, so many incredible little little insects and the, um, and the medicinal plants and walking through uh, next to the river, um, having masala chai prepared over a fire next to uh, next to the river was was something very memorable. So uh, I'm not sure it's not possible as far as I'm aware. There may be some other parks Amit can chime in to actually get out of your vehicle and walk in the national parks. But in some of those buffer zones, uh, yes, it, it, it is doable uh, to do that. Amit, what else can you comment yeah, on? Yeah, so almost all the national parks, you can do buffer walks outside uh you know uh, outside the national park no, nobody can do it inside the national park there are specific parks like satpura where you can go on a walk inside the national park as well but you don't see a lot just because the wildlife is not used to you being on foot you're mostly on the jeep so it's better to do the jeeps but the 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 buffer zone is no different from the core so once you start walking in the buffer zone it'll look exactly like you're in the park so it's not like you know you're going to walk in farms and fields and things like that you can definitely head on a proper nature walk um in in those areas and there are areas in rajasthan for example in Chawai, where you can get out and go on walks as well you know you can go climb a hill or something like that but those are not for tigers those are particularly for leopards full day pass versus morning uh, or, or a in morning or afternoon pass um on an eighteen hundred dollars roughly for the vehicle for a full day pass which you can have yeah. four Cool. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's quite expensive to get the full day pass. The forty, uh, it's about eighteen hundred dollars, but that's not per person; that's per jeep. So you can have about four people sit in the jeep. Uh, so if you divide it, then it makes a lot of sense to have that. Uh, a regular pass, it varies anywhere. It depends on the zone and the day of the week. From you know two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars for a vehicle, not per person. So you know all those factors make a difference. The full day pass. I do not recommend that you get it every day because it's tiring 12 hours of the day, 12 and a half hours of the day in the park. So, you know, during a trip, I would throw it at least one time or two times inside the park, inside a different park. So that way you have good day. I have photographers who do trips just for full day permits as well, you know, and they get some amazing footage uh, while, while they're doing that. So, you know, yes, anybody can pay the money, but is it, are you willing to spend 12 and a half hours of the park every day inside the park is also something that you want to consider. Oh, do I, do I do lions and reptiles? Absolutely do lions and reptiles. Uh, depends. So I, I know a bunch of these questions have also popped up in, do we do Nagarhole? Do we do, we do all of India, you know, and of course we do the, the subcontinent as well, but India is our expertise. So don't, don't treat us that these are the only parks that we go to. We are a full service DMC operating, whether it's in culture, of course, wildlife is more in the blood for three generations. So, well, you know, the knowledge of wildlife is quite amazing. What we have, what others don't. Uh, but, you know, uh, definitely operate for all types of wildlife and definitely culture as well throughout the country. Snow leopards is a big focus. We didn't talk about that. That's almost 20% of my business. Uh, that's how much it dominates my business today uh, because I started snow leopard trips about 15 years ago when nobody was doing them, ran them for the first six, seven years camping, eight years or so, you know, didn't really get the packs. We got low numbers of the groups. And suddenly, you know, uh, since we have a large situation up there, we've been selling lots of snow leopard trips, snow leopard and tiger trips, snow leopards and culture trips, uh, and snow leopards and festivals. So there are many different combinations people are doing. We had some incredible sightings right now uh, as well with snow leopard chases and on a kill and doing things like that. Alexis is going to look at me. It's like, we didn't see any. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Amit, uh, Scott's got a question about the different lodges. The Snow Leopard Lodge is one of the, the two up there and, and our, um, generally our preferred lodge. Maybe you can talk about the two different options and the differences. Yeah, no, we, there, there are two different lodges up there. The uh, Snow Leopard trips costs anywhere from six to $7,000 US, you know, just to give you guys an idea, uh, you know, and, and that's for next season. The, the Snow Leopard Lodge 
is, is a community run lodge. Uh, it is going to have about nine rooms next year. It's, it's going through a little bit of a change, but all the rooms are going to have attached bathrooms, but no running water. But it, it is on this amazing landscape where you look outside your room, you walk outside and you have these rolling Himalayas you know, around you, which is one of the most beautiful sceneries on earth. Within 30 minutes of a flight from Delhi, you're gonna start hitting the Himalayas and you're gonna have this amazing you know, landing in a beautiful town called Leh with monks, monasteries, you know, and half the town is empty at that time because it's winter and you stay in a perfectly good hotel, acclimatize, you land at about 3,400 meters up there uh, and, and you will spend two days acclimatizing, seeing a little bit of the town as well, and then go to the lodge for about six nights. Um, the sightings have been quite good. So it is it is a little bit of a luck is definitely involved in it, but you need to sort of spend that five, six nights. People say, can we do it in half the time? No, you can't. Uh, you know, I do not recommend it because you need time to acclimatize and then you need to get out to the lodge. So the whole trip is about nine to 10 days. Is that, um, and, and that's not that bad for the snow leopard, you know, that if you're able to get that. The other lodge is a little bit more higher end in terms of more gourmet meals. Uh, you know, investment has come from abroad for it. Uh, the suites have attached bathrooms and the suites are, you know, have running water as well. Um, you know, it's very too different. You know, if you have a client who's difficult and wants only the best, then of course, Lungmar. You know, if the client is willing to sort of see snow leopards and, you know, okay with no running water and, you know, more sort of, and very good guides, exceptional guides, exceptional trackers, I can promise you that much, uh, you know, will be there. And good English speaking guides are up there. Uh, Gulzar, who's one of our main guides up there, is exceptional as well. So, you know, both different, and I can share more details about that over itineraries of programs and things like that. Cool. Any other questions from anybody? <clears throat> I think we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. Uh, again, Mark, thanks so much for being our guide and for laying out some of yep. these key uh, compare and contrast with the African safari experience. Ahmed, thanks as always for your insights. Uh, I was here just to show off my my Indian vest, which I got in Jaipur. Uh, I forgot to mention why I was wearing this stylish vest. I did have one comment. Thank you, Alexis. I don't know where the rest of you were, but in any case, uh, this is again a little cool thing that Ahmed's team does. We all got fitted for for saris, and um, and the guys got Indian vests uh, while we were in Jaipur, and uh, we we were then able to uh, to rock some proper Indian uh, style at uh, at various uh, points along the trip. So. Uh, I had to bring it out for today because you don't get too many opportunities to wear uh, <laughs> such a cool piece of um, of attire. So definitely uh, disappointing that you didn't wear the turban, Tad. I'm I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> you know, if I could tie the if I could tie the turban, I would have worn it. But uh, still, still practicing. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your uh, your day. Thanks for spending an hour with us. Thank you, guys. Again, thank thanks. you.